please uh, welcome Brian Jacob. Uh, hello, uh, good morning. I'm, uh, it's great to see so many folks here. Um, I'd again like to thank all of the uh, our doctoral students and oh, okay. I thought from you I was gonna have to bring it down a little bit. Um, down, I'm the middle. Um, you can see how much in charge of anything I am. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so just uh, again a thanks to all of the very hardworking uh, students and postdocs and staff who have helped uh, make this event possible. Um, so, let's see, I'm going to jump right in, I think, uh, uh, try to give uh, some uh, discussion of this, the, our initial findings of the Michigan Mayor curriculum. I'm going to say this a few times as I go through the presentation, but I think one thing import that's important to keep in mind is when we say the impacts or the effects, what we're really talking about here is just on the very first cohort of students that experience the, the mandate of the curriculum. So as you know, the first group to, for whom the curriculum was binding was those who were graduating in 2010, 2011. And so we're, um, because we're looking at things like high school graduation and not just four-year graduation, but five-year graduation and trying to look at college enrollment, um, not enough time has passed for us to look at these outcomes for subsequent cohorts. So I think this is, should be useful information, but we uh, shouldn't take this as the final word on uh, anything. Uh, okay, so just a, a little context, uh, academic, uh, where did this come from, what is the kind of the context in which this uh, Michigan America curriculum was uh, proposed and uh, adopted here in Michigan. Uh, it was really in the context of stagnant high school uh, achievement across the U.S. for the past 40 years. So some statistics here, achievement has barely moved um, and you don't have to take my word for this, you can Wow, this is slow. Um, so these are NAEP, National Assessment of Education Progress Achievement Trends in Math. Um, look at the line for 17-year-olds on the top. Uh, compared to uh, 1973, those students in 2008 were virtually the same. And reading, this looks at reading, and this uh, shows you for 17-year-olds in reading, doesn't just give you the average or the median, which is the 50th percentile line in the middle, but looks at the very lowest achieving students and even the very highest achieving students at the 90th percentile. And you see these numbers have barely budged at all. And so I think this is um, people, uh, this data is made possible by Jack Buckley and all of the folks at NCES. Uh, and this helps us understand the, um, uh, the, the lack of improvement, I think that was one of the motivating factors um, in uh, the adoption of the MMC. High school graduation rates have not risen much nationally. So this is something, first of all, they've been very hard to measure, um, surprisingly, but in the last five or so years, uh, researchers have kind of looked more carefully and found kind of ways to properly account for various kind of mobility and, and so forth and found figures that look like this. This is based on high school graduating classes. If you go back, I mean, for males, comparing the high school graduates of 1966 to 2006, that is 40 years. And we are at the same place. Uh, females, been some improvement, but that's been mostly in the last you know, five or so years. Um, so people look at these trends and I think uh, are motivated to change. BA attainment is leveling off uh, despite the large economic returns to college. So some figures that Sue and others have put together before, you look the red line is uh, some college completed, uh, the blue line is BAs, completed BAs. And that certainly was growing, going up over time. The x-axis here, the horizontal axis is their actual year of birth. So it's a little bit different. But if you look at the last you know, five or six uh, years on the blue line, you'll see there's not much, has not been much change in BA attainment rates across the U.S. So, okay, and then kind of uh, as many of you have, have heard in the news, kind of the U.S. performs about average uh, internationally and that's uh, has some people uh, worried as kind of economics uh, becomes more of a global marketplace. 
What are some of the common policies that people, uh, states, uh, districts have tried to improve high school performance? Well, when, I, when we, you go back and look at this, I, I was actually a bit surprised at how many different types of reforms there have been at the elementary level. Um, when you look at the high school level and what kind of reforms have been tried, it's much more limited. There's been some organizational structural changes. There's uh, some work, you know, especially in earlier decades, on career technical education, some dropout prevention programs. But by far the most kind of common reform to uh, stagnating high school achievement has been to raise uh, standards in some form or another, uh, most prominently high school graduation requirements. So, and this is not new, I and mean, one thing that I think it's important to understand the context of the MMC is that we've had policies like this for a long time, starting in the 1970s, uh, minimum competency exams of basic skills that were starting to be required for graduation. The 1980s, uh, uh, for those of you who are kind of uh, active in education at that time, you probably remember the new basics, which is um, the push for all states to raise the number of required courses to four years of English and three years each of math, science, and social studies. Um, and many states uh, and districts did that. Uh, uh, high school exit exams. Um, and then No Child Left Behind. I guess the last decade our country has been mostly focused on No Child Left Behind from the, at the, the biggest perspective, which I think is most people believe is for, focused largely on elementary schools. Um, and there hasn't been as much national attention on high schools. Uh, that is changing, obviously. So what is the rationale for higher standards? Um, one, and these are things that you know, come up not only in national debates, but if you go back and look at the record in Michigan in 2005, 2006, when the uh, MMC was passed, you'll find kind of these arguments being made uh, among advocates. One is that it ensures students are prepared for college and or jobs in the 21st century economy. Uh, it kind of adds more coherence to the education system. One of the, I think, primary uh, intended benefits uh, for many is to reduce some of that variation Sue showed us before. Um, we know there are big gaps in uh, high school graduation and college enrollment, even within districts, I mean, certainly even within high schools. Um, to to some extent that might be due to variation in course taking and if we can kind of uh, formalize and um, improve the course taking of some students that uh, weren't taking rigorous courses in the past, maybe this will help uh, reduce some of the gaps later on. Uh, the thoughts that kind of implementing these uh, new requirements would spur other changes in curriculum, pedagogy, teacher professional development. Um, now, what are some of the concerns with the uh, with higher standards? Uh, there certainly was a concern voiced at the time and continually that uh, they may lead to increased dropout rates, particularly among disadvantaged students. People have uh, cited the reduced opportunity to take electives and CTE courses. On the other hand, I know talking with um, some folks at the State Department and various districts that there really uh, are still kind of substantial opportunities for some elective taking, um, but that's certainly been mentioned as one, uh, one issue. Uh, there's a concern about unintended consequences. Certainly uh, um, uh, some, some mention of things like cheating. One, one thing that has come up anecdotally is kind of relabeling of courses. Now that you know, everyone has to take and pass Algebra 2, well, maybe they are, but Algebra 2 might not be exactly like we think Algebra 2 would be. Um, and this is something that we don't have much evidence on now, but as part of kind of our, the second phase of our research project, we are embarking on a large uh, study of high school transcripts. And we, will, uh, we have and will be contacting probably many people in the room uh, to try to encourage your high schools to work with us in helping us look at um, uh, student high school transcripts and to shed better light on course taking uh, changes as a result of the MMC. Uh, one concern is that this requires substantial, uh, requires substantial capacity on the part of teachers and schools um, that sharply increase the demand for math and science teachers. Um, and that's a, you know, a difficult area to fill even in the best of times. Now we're going to have even higher, uh, a higher bar and 
you know, to what extent is the state prepared for that? And then uh, there might be some concern that uh, this reform really won't have much of an impact, perhaps positively or negatively, on students that were already taking these courses, um, and we still need something for those students. So uh, can we learn anything from past efforts um, by uh, other states and districts to, uh, that have adopted similar policies? Well, there's been a good bit of research on high school exit exams, these exams students take in 10th or 11th grade that are required for high school graduation. Um, I mean, I've done some of this work, some other folks in the room have done some. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the, there's been uh, little promise of these policies. They have, you know, increase uh, dropout rate slightly among low achieving groups and don't show much measurable improvement in student achievement among other groups. There's, uh, there is somewhat more evidence to support raising graduation requirements. There has been some evidence that of um, economic payoffs for taking higher level math and science courses. Um, so that, that certainly is kind of one of, was I think one of the thoughts behind the Michigan Merit curriculum. Um, there have been very few policies thus far that have attempted something uh, exactly the same as the Michigan Merit Curriculum. The only, the policies that we have evidence on are two policies, one in Chicago and one in Charlotte Mecklenburg, North Carolina, where they were really requiring all students to take Algebra 1 and in Charlotte Mecklenburg requiring them to take it earlier in 8th grade as opposed to ninth or 10th grade. These, um, uh, the results of these studies have not been uh, too positive, they uh, led to reductions in student achievement. Um, the authors of these kind of evaluations have cited two potential hypotheses which I think are um, important for us to keep in mind when thinking about the Michigan Merit Curriculum. One is this, uh, these students that were uh, kind of quote unquote forced into the classes under these policies may have been overplaced, not sufficiently prepared for the courses, um, and that uh, teachers may not have been prepared to teach uh, these courses or these students in these courses. And so this is uh, something that uh, we might think about in kind of when we're interpreting some of the results for the uh, merit curriculum. Okay, so this is um, uh, a chart showing other states that have adopted policies similar to Michigan. So uh, these are uh, states that uh, have required students high school graduation classes to pass at least Algebra 1 and Geometry. You can see Kansas starting with the high school graduating class of 2009, um, Oklahoma in 2010, um, uh, Michigan is among the first of these states but not the very first. Um, one of the next steps in some of our research here is to do some comparisons Michigan um, comparing Michigan's experience to the experience of these other states. But again, um, when we use national data sets to look at this, there just hasn't been enough time elapsed to get college enrollment, high school graduation from many cohorts for these various states. So we'll be uh, certainly using uh, data in coming years to try to examine uh, variation across uh, states and hopefully learn from that. So what Michigan high school reform, I think many of you, most people in the room are familiar with this, but just so we're all on the same page. Uh, Michigan passed a set of reforms in spring 2006 that were based on a set of new uh, K-12 education standards. One was the introduction of the new uh, high school exam, the Michigan Merit Exam, uh, part of which was the ACT. Um, and that's nice, uh, nice for research purposes because it gives us another kind of common metric and one that's used across the country to track high school uh, student achievement. Um, and as opposed to the past, we're looking at ACT scores. One would always be concerned, well, not every student takes the ACT. And of course, well, you're looking at ACT scores, but that's only kind of the more college inclined students. Uh, the set of data that we're looking at, starting with the uh, ninth graders in 0405, all of these students were required to take the MME and thus the ACT. So when you look at the test taking rates, they're really quite high and don't change much over, um, over time. So we don't have that issue of selective test taking that we might have had in the past. Uh, Michigan Merit uh, Curriculum. 
this is what we all know of. We'll, we'll be uh, talking a bit more about that in a slide or two. And then the Promise Scholarship, as Barbara mentioned, this was uh, discontinued, uh, certainly was a very important reform uh, uh, initially, we'll be doing a little bit of research on that uh, in the coming years as well. This was part of the package of reforms that was passed. Uh, so the Michigan Mayor Curriculum. Uh, uh, a set of uh, more rigorous college prep courses that were required for graduation. Okay, so uh, the, the ones that you mostly hear about are uh, the math credits. So the, the I think the innovation of the Michigan Merit Curriculum was not the fact that four math classes were required, but which classes specifically were required. So students were required to take and complete Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry, plus one other course. Um, science, uh, Biology, and then Chemistry or Physics, plus one additional course. And kind of some of the other requirements that folks know of. Um, you know, our, my understanding is that the math and science kind of what anecdotally and based on the data we have were really the, the biggest changes in relative to what had been happening in the past. Um, to give us a sense of how big those changes were, uh, there was a, a survey done by the superintendent in 2005 of districts to understand what districts were requiring on their own prior to the passage of the MMC. And you'll see that uh, Algebra 1, only 32% of responding districts were requiring even Algebra 1. Once we get down to Algebra 2, only 12% of responding districts were requiring Algebra 2. Um, and uh, we have some other data that I'll show at the end. Among those districts that weren't requiring it, a very small fraction of students were taking these kind of upper level math and science courses. So this is just to underscore that this this was a big change. This is a big change that this, uh, students and teachers throughout the state have been grappling with over the past few years. Um, uh, and so making it even more important to try to understand how this reform is playing out and what the impacts are. Uh, as a gentleman mentioned earlier, there is a kind of personal curriculum that allows students to graduate uh, you know, in ways that are not exactly like those outlined before. My understanding is it's relatively limited. Uh, there were initial plans for statewide end of course exams. Uh, those, uh, I think for funding reasons, but perhaps for other reasons, were uh, uh, never progressed to, to fully to completion. Um, and then, so I think one of the other interesting things about this policy, which is distinct from uh, some in other states, is um, uh, the end of course exams that students are required to pass to indicate that they've met the Michigan Merit Curriculum uh, are can be developed by schools and districts themselves and the schools and districts themselves can set their own standards. This is very different than uh, other states where there is a centralized state algebra one exam with a centralized passing cutoff. Um, uh, and so that's another kind of unique feature of the merit curriculum. Okay, so finally getting to some of the uh, the current study and uh, some uh, fun figures like Sue has. Um, so what are we doing here? We're the the EMSR, our consortium is engaged in kind of two different uh, pieces to this research project. One is a statistical analysis of student achievement, high school completion, and college going. This is the work that I'll be presenting to you uh, today. The second, though, is this Michigan High School Transcript Study, which I think is going to be at least as, if not more, interesting and informative than the statistical analysis, where we're doing some more intensive data collection um, in 150 randomly selected high schools throughout the state. Um, and the goal there is to measure the, uh, the implementation of the Michigan Merit Curriculum and to try to help uh, uncover some of the underlying mechanisms, how uh, students and teachers were responding, um, what some of the challenges were, what some of the successes have been. But today we are gonna uh, stick uh, to the statistical analysis for someone like me that uh, feels very comfortable and natural, so I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, 
We, as Sue mentioned, we are uh, focusing, this analysis focuses on ninth grade cohorts. This is students starting ninth grade in 0405, up through students starting ninth grade in 0809. One thing that we're going to be doing throughout this that is not so much shown in the figures but is underlying all of the estimates and results that we show you and everything that we do we've been controlling for uh, students eighth grade math scores and demographics and other um, school characteristics. So one thing that I think you everyone is aware of is that Michigan like the rest of the country has experienced you know uh, an economic downturn over the past um, five, ten, ten years. Um, and you can see that very easily in the data, I think as Ken will show later on, the fraction of students eligible for free and reduced price lunch in the state has jumped considerably. Um, and so uh, we're trying to account for those changes um, using some of the information we have in this rich administrative data set. Um, we know that otherwise there had been some improvement in student uh, MEEP scores over time, perhaps better preparation among elementary school students in Michigan. Again, by looking at students' eighth grade math scores and, and controlling for that, we're trying to take into account those changes. The research design we're, we're using is something called an interrupted time series. I will kind of uh, illustrate that in one of our uh, slides coming up. Uh, the outcomes are the ones we've mentioned before, high school completion, college enrollment, <laughs> high school achievement. And the, I think the one big caveat is that uh, all of the estimated effects that are, you're going to be seeing here are based solely on this very first cohort of students to experience the Michigan Merit Curriculum. Uh, for these ninth graders that were following over time, we track them and out of uh, all the different outcomes that could uh, students could experience, we group them into four categories for simplicity. Graduated, uh, that is the official graduation, so it is not a, uh, but it could include folks with a personal curriculum, but it is not some other high school completion measure, it is kind of the official graduation indicator. Whether they're still enrolled in the Michigan public high school, that's the other outcome. Whether they dropped out, and again this is kind of the official, somewhat narrow definition of dropping out that um, is used kind of in some, uh, some but not all CEPI reports. Um, and others, the category of folks that either transferred to a private school, left the state, um, or um, had an unknown status, meaning kind of their district and school didn't, didn't quite know what happened to them. And note this kind of other category is relatively small. Um, uh, probably one reason for that is we're starting with students who are in ninth grade in Michigan public high schools, so it's not as if uh, we're not capturing a lot of the churning and exit that you see up through ninth grade. So what do we see here? What do these pluses and minuses and zeros mean? These are meant to uh, show you the effect. So this is kind of a the effect of the Michigan Merit Curriculum. So if you first look at all students, gra four year graduation, this is whether they uh, graduate high school within four years of their ninth grade year. That negative sign meant there's, there was a reduction. So we'd say the Michigan Merit Curriculum reduced the likelihood of four year kind of on time high school graduation overall. This was a small, very small effect to kind of give you a rough guideline. It was kind of went from 72% um, to about 70%. So kind of small change for that group. Um, still enrolled you'll see that that actually increased. Uh, and over four years, um, uh, in the four year time period, not much, no change, zeros mean no change, no effect on dropping out or kind of their being in this other category. Uh, I think one thing that's gonna be, I think the most interesting thing, and hopefully the thing that uh, jumps out if you've been, when looking at this table is if you look at top quartile students. For most of our analysis, what we've done is we group students into four groups based on their pre-high school performance. This is kind of you know, taking into account their eighth grade uh, standardized achievement scores, kind of their poverty level, a whole host of factors, and using that information kind of have quartiles of students. We are mostly in this presentation going to be focusing on the top and the bottom quartile because that really illustrates the, the the spectrum of effects. If you look at the two middle quartiles, um, 
they kind of roughly mirror. The third quartile roughly is similar to the fourth, and the second is similar to the first. Um, so to clarify, we just, just look at the top and the bottom. For the top quartile, you see a bunch of zeros. So really, that's telling you that the Michigan Merit Curriculum did not have any impact, either positive or negative, for the highest performing students entering Michigan high schools. This is in terms of their graduation, enrollment, dropout. We'll see, we'll later we're gonna show you the achievement effects. But for bottom quartile students, we see there were some, uh, some impacts. We see reductions in high school graduation. Uh, and then we see an increase kind of in all of the other categories. You know, they, re they were less likely to graduate, and what, what were they doing in, instead of graduating? Well, some of them were still enrolled, some of them had dropped out, and some were in this kind of other category, uh, which can include a, bu a bunch of different things. So let's go, let's go to the figures, um, and hopefully this will kind of, uh, you know, clarify some things. This is uh, four-year graduation by initial achievement quartile. You'll see the, the, the bottom line is kind of for the lowest quartile students and the top line is for the, the top quartile. So even in 2005, um, the, or I should say for the ninth graders in 2005 who were six, seven, eight, the high school class in theory of 07, 08, um, the four year graduation rate for this group was uh, only about 40%. Uh, up to about 90% for the top quartile students. And so what we're doing in this uh, analysis is tracking the changes over time for these different cohorts of students. So for the top quartile students, you see pretty much even trends, 90%, 90%, 90%. Um, and it doesn't really change much. This red line here distinguishes uh, the class for whom the Michigan Merit Curriculum was binding. So you'll see this the group here in 2008, um, these are freshmen in 2008. So if you count forward, that means they're sophomores in uh, 09, juniors in 10, seniors in 2011. So this was really the group, uh, the first class for whom, the first class for whom the, uh, the requirement was binding. Not much change in this group. Going down to the bottom quartile, You'll see that from 05 to 06, 07, there was kind of slight increases in the high school graduation group rate of this group of students. Um, and then uh, in 08, for this group, it declines noticeably. So one thing we're gonna be, just to kind of give you an intuition, what should we have expected this 2008 high school graduation rate to be? Well, you might think if uh, the trends in the state, this kind of slight modest improvement among the bottom quartile students had continued, you might expect the line to be there. And then, you, and then uh, what we're doing, this is kind of the essence of what researchers refer to as the interrupted time series, you say, well, uh, we might expect if our trends continued as before, uh, the 08 cohort to be here, we see them down here where the, uh, the dark triangle is. This little square bracket here shows you the difference between where we expected them to be and where they ended up. And this, you can, this, is, uh, this illustrates kind of the negative, uh, negative impact on high school completion. They are below, the black triangle is below where we expected them to be. So throughout the analysis, um, when I present the results, you can kind of think about this in intuition here um, one thing we also did is in some of the, some cases, if we weren't sure about uh, the prior trends, we just compared the 2007 versus 2008. Um, so this shows you kind of the four year graduation uh, reductions. So where are these students? What, what happened to them? Well, this is uh, an indication of whether they were still enrolled in a Michigan public high school after four years. So this is in the fall of what would have been their fifth year in high school. And so we see here um, increases. You know, it's going down here and then it kind of bumps back up again. And so uh, as illustrated by this graph, at the, at the 
after four years, what largely was happening is students were extending their stay in high school. We didn't see any large changes in dropouts right after the fourth year. We didn't see many changes in kind of this other category. Basically, fewer people were officially graduating, but they were back in high school in that fifth year, presumably trying to make it through a lot of the additional requirements. So that was, I think, the, if we want to take away something for the four-year high school completion results, that's the main takeaway. Five-year, this is after five years. Um, and so you notice we only have what are this last cohort, 2008 is the last group here. That's because five year graduation for them was June 2012. And that's kind of the latest data that's available. We see reductions in this group among the bottom quartile. Again, notice for the top quartile or even the top two quartiles, not much changed at all. Uh, we see still enrolled, some increases um, among students that are still enrolled. And then um, uh, four-year dropout rates, I'm going to kind of skip through that, fifth-year dropout rates. So this is at the end of five years, um, what do we see? We, again, this, now you're going to have to switch your eyes. For dropout rates, the bottom lines are the highest performing students because they have the lowest dropout rates. This top line here is this bottom quartile of students. Um, right here, we see, you know, for the 2007 uh, cohort of ninth graders, it was about 11%. And then for the 2008, it went up to about 12 or 13%. So it was an increase of about two percentage points relative to an 11% baseline. That's kind of the increase, uh, again, among this bottom quartile of students. So you'll see throughout this, one of our main takeaways is very big differences based on the prior student preparation, which is something we probably shouldn't be surprised on, surprised about based on kind of earlier policies like this. Um, are there any questions on this? Like, I know I've been talking just nonstop for a while here. Me. Uh, Yeah, well, so there's, um, well, there's two things. One is to break these students up into quartiles, it's largely using their eighth grade uh, math test score. Now, it, it does take into account some things like whether they're free and reduced price lunch. It's kind of a general measure of uh, achievement and socioeconomic status kind of, you know, combined. But if, if it's e it might be easiest to think of as just quartiles of eighth grade uh, math achievement. Um, so, any any questions on? Yep. Right. Okay. Well, the Michigan Community College Association again. Uh, just a quick question. So, can you talk in terms of the? I may be answering my own question here. Maybe silly. I, I'm trying to get a sense of the number of students overall. How many how many students are we talking about in in the different yes. cohorts? Um, let's see. Each cohort of ninth graders is about let's say 120,000, 125,000. Um, and so 1% of that would be 1,300. Is that right, Sue? You have to check my math. So 1%, one percentage point would be 1,300. And so if we're saying a two percentage point increase in dropout would be uh, 2,600. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I was interested to, to know if you tracked that amongst IEP students or uh, students we, with uh, learning um, disabilities. We uh, we certainly could. We, I, again, like Sue, we have that data. My guess is sometime in the last two months among the 150 tables we did, I, I have that somewhere. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Yeah, I just but know I from personal experience and amongst my peers, I think that gap from the four to five year kids, it's that's primarily that group, at least that's been our experience. Right. And so this could, a lot of this, that could be one of the reasons why this bottom quartile is is showing, I mean, if you're saying that the if my, largest effects might be for students with IEPs, there's probably, a, I think there is a large overlap between students with an IEP and students with kind of lower eighth grade math scores. So I think that's, 
they're probably, a lot of them are probably contained in this upper line here. Although it's, you're right, it's not focusing explicitly on them. Right. And interestingly enough, we can keep them until they're 26, but it counts against our graduation rate when they don't finish in four. Right. Okay. Ishmael from uh, Macomb Community College. I was wondering whether you have found any vari regional variations in terms of districts. Yeah, and this is that's a great question. Um, uh, we have not we have not uh, done that yet. And so one of the, this is what we did is we have done kind of results overall, and then we started by looking separately based on some kind of student subgroups. Um, and we did this a few different ways, but I think we decided that the most kind of informative way to show this was based on their prior preparation. Um, I think the next step is to be looking uh, separately by uh, districts, regions, um, along the line that kind of Sue mentioned, to understand whether there are particular districts that are, you know, uh, appearing to be more successful or districts that are having kind of more challenges. I mean, that's, we haven't done yet, that yet, but we certainly will. Joanne Wilson, um, Portage Public Schools, Kalamazoo Risa. So let's go back to your 1A. 1A, yep. So we've got approximately 125,000 ninth grade students in this cohort in, let's say, 2005. Close. I'm, I, I'm done with my kitchen math and swagging here. So pretty, pretty constant in the state of Michigan, we graduate. We have cohorts of about 125,000 students a year. So yeah, I mean, it's been going down a little, little bit the last five years, but okay. 125, 30. Okay, so the cohort in 2005 is at ninth grade. And then is that that they graduated in 08, or is that strictly a ninth grade cohort? No, so the, o, the 05 dot, the dot here that is the 2005 uh, let's say the 2005 black diamond or black triangle, that is um, the, the fraction of students who entered ninth grade in 0405 okay. who were in the bottom quartile of their entering high school class. So it's taking ninth graders in 0405, the bottom quartile of those ninth graders in 0405, and then looking, following them four years later, so that would be 06, 07, 08. So looking at by June 08, what fraction had graduated high school? Exactly. And so 40% by uh, June 08, 40% of that group had graduated high school. Yeah, Michigan public high school. Objection of the, of the MME. Hmm? Thank you. Okay. Um, so let me, let me kind of push ahead now. Uh, I have some other results that are going to show on high school achievement, so maybe I'll show those and then we can come back to answer other questions as well. So now we're going to look at uh, test scores by uh, student achievement test scores. And so we're going to look uh, uh, separately by subjects. First of all, this figure is all the ACT scores. Um, the figure on the, uh, the left is for the top quartile students. The figure on the right is the bottom quartile students. These, uh, the numbers have been standardized. So for those of you that are familiar with these, these are standard deviation units or kind of effect sizes. Um, and so what we'll, let's look at the top quartile. So for the top quartile students, you see um, there, been, there, were, there were steady increases prior to the uh, um, MMC in uh, all subjects. Kind of the top line is uh, math. This is kind of the, and again, if you want to get your head around this, ninth graders in 05, if they're taking 11th grade, this would be uh, the 2007 uh, test taking group um, going up, and then uh, not much, you know, a slight improvement from 07 to 08, but if you look at this, it looks like it's kind of roughly following the same pattern as before. So, um, actually when you uh, do add the controls and do the statistical models, it, what you come out with, it, there's not much effect 
uh, on uh, math, a slight positive effect for the highest achieving students on their ACT score in math. But then look down, the next two lines are science and reading. Here you see much more noticeable increases between the 07 cohort and the 08 cohort. Um, and when you, again, run this through the statistical machinery, you get, um, you know, uh, modest improve modest, you know, I would say modest, meaning bigger than small, but smaller than huge, um, improvements in uh, reading and uh, science achievement. And so uh, this suggests for the top quartile students, the um, Michigan Merit curriculum was increasing science achievement, increasing reading achievement as measured by the ACT, had maybe a tiny increase in math, but not so much in math. Um, the big, one, one thing, uh, the noticeable difference is writing. You see ACT writing scores kind of going along mostly even a little bit upward and then dropping down dramatically uh, after the uh, MMC. So we see uh, a substantial reduction in writing achievement um, associated with the MMC for the top quartile of students. Um, for the bottom quartile of students, uh, we see uh, some uh, similar pattern for writing. Writing kind of this top line is writing right here, goes here, goes way down. Um, we see not much changes for any of the other subjects. So kind of relatively even trends. Um, so really not much positive or negative uh, achievement effects for the bottom quartile. Okay. Here's what we do looking at the MME test scores. Um, one interesting pattern of results that we found that uh, kind of you might notice if you look carefully here is that in general the trends and the improvement among Michigan high school students both prior to the MMC and kind of during the MMC period was larger for, a, for the ACT uh, scores than it was for the overall MME scores. Now it's a, that's a little bit tricky to think about because we know the MME Part of the MME is the ACT. So that is a, a bit uh, confusing to think about, but I think um, I'd be curious to hear uh, people's thoughts or hypotheses about kind of differences between ACT and MME at some point. Um, uh, here again, we see, we see uh, I think the pattern of results is for the top quartile student, maybe some slight improvement, certainly a noticeable improvement in science. Um, uh, for the bottom quartile students, uh, not much, um, uh, not many, no positive effects, and we see some, this is kind of a, uh, for reading, maybe uh, math, maybe a negative effect there. Um, and so maybe the easiest way to, to summarize this is here. For the top quartile students, we see positive effects in, for the ACT in science, math, and reading, but negative effects in writing. And, uh, okay. And for the, uh, the bottom quartile students, we see the zero, remember the zeros are no effects, the negative is, the minus signs are negative effects, um, uh, and the positive are, the plus signs are positive effects. If you are kind of, if you are thinking yourself, okay, what's the bottom line? Tell me in one sentence, what does this mean? Uh, why is this, there's all sorts of different things here. I mean, I think after wrestling with the data for many months and talking it over, I think the bottom line is that it is a mixed pattern of results. There is not one clean, simple answer that is true for every type of student in the state. Um, I think in general we see kind of more positive effects for the upper quartile students in terms of these achievement test scores, which is consistent with the, you know, kind of uh, better outcomes for them in terms of the high school completion. Um, what do we see? We see some more positive effects for science than for math, which I think was, we certainly didn't predict that, and then that's kind of interesting and worthy of further explanation. Um, and we see uh, across the board for all types of students, uh, substantial decreases in writing, uh, ACT writing scores. So why don't, I, why don't I stop there now and 
for some more questions about this. Uh, you're looking at the, you know, your, your interrupted time series piece. Uh, as compared to the interrupted time series, is this positive gain in these subject areas above and beyond what you would expect to, as far as the trend line goes, or is it just increases? No, so this, these all, all the, when you see the summaries here, these are plus or minus or zero relative to what you would expect. So a plus for the ACT science doesn't just mean the 2008 was higher than the 2007, it means it was significantly higher than you even would have predicted it to be based on a bunch of things. So. Sure. Mary Beth Dam, um, U of M. So I have a question. Did you look at the effects or try to control it all for, I mean, I wouldn't expect that there were any increased rigor in terms of classes yet from the change in terms of that. But I also wondered, what about educational financing in the state? What effect did that have and does it, do you think it shows up? And the increased amount of test prep is interesting. I work in schools all over the place and many of them have been increasing the ACT test prep especially at lower achieving schools. And it's fascinating to see that this might be an interesting result yeah, no, for that too. Um, those are both good questions. We, we definitely at this point have not uh, looked into kind of any of those deeper mechanisms. I mean, I think that the test prep is the type of thing that we're hoping to get from the high school transcript study when we go, which is gonna include some interviews with principals and teachers, not simply the collection of transcripts. So I think we're gonna, hopefully some of that will come out in this kind of second big piece of the project. Um, but that, that's an excellent uh, point. Was any data gathered for the, uh, the top and bottom quartile with regard to remediation rates uh, for those going to community colleges? You know, we, um, not yet, although that is definitely on the agenda. One of the, we have some college enrollment uh, results. And I think the college enrollment results um, largely mirror the, uh, the high school completion. So not, not much change at all among the top group. The bottom quartile group, we see reductions in college completion, I guess which is not surprising because we see reductions in high school graduation. Um, but I think we're, we've been a bit more leery to even kind of start looking at the, the college enrollment because it's been such a short period of time. Um, we know that a lot of students even before weren't graduating in four years. There's a comment from the audience that usually for low income students you see college enrollment more two years after. Um, so uh, we're definitely going to be looking at all sorts of college outcomes including remediation. I think that'll probably be the next, the next set of analyses we do. What are, the, what are the hypotheses behind the writing scores going down for all students? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, uh, I think some of the hypotheses that we've um, thought about on our end, I'm sure people here who are actually working in schools every day will have a, an even better sense. But uh, our initial thought had been largely a reallocation of time and effort and resources um, away from writing uh, to some of the new requirements on the MMC. So I think it's... Uh, but weren't the English requirements be as well? Well, the, I mean, the English requirements, there, was, there were four years, it was four years of English, um, uh, but almost every district before was, was requiring students to take four years of some English. Um, there, was, there, was, there were maybe small changes in English and kind of the social studies history, but if you go back and look at the new requirements relative to the old state, but also relative to what districts were doing on their own, you see, you see that the primary changes that were being required in the MMC were changes in the math and science. Um, and so, I mean, this, that result of the writing is consistent. There's other studies that show um, uh, reductions in achievement among kind of low stake subjects. So even when you look at elementary schools, under NCLB and you see improvements in reading and math. In some places, in some cases, you see slight reductions in science and social studies. And the hypothesis there is teachers are kind of shifting the focus kind of toward the uh, higher stake subjects. 
Evan Hordike from uh, looking at figure four would I be interpreting that correctly to say that in 2009 the reduction more than offset the gains from 2008 so yeah so this um, it is certainly true uh, that kind of the this is the raw data kind of the average uh, achievement of this group this doesn't um, this doesn't have any of the kind of controls for eighth grade ability or the eighth grade achievement scores of the other factors. So I, um, I think when we look at when we look at this, in, in some of the models when we looked at this, uh, the 2009 group um, uh, didn't look as you know looked a little bit uh, worse than the 2008 group, but not as much as this picture would make you think. Um, uh, yeah, but so that but this is I don't I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but the the 2009 group was not quite as positive as the 2008 group. Um, Brian, <coughs> Glenn Nelson from the Ann Arbor School Board. I just want to uh, put a little more emphasis on Mary Beth's question about. <coughs> finances that I think the the estimates you get on your control variable or variables with respect to resources available or funding might be of at least as much interest as those you get on the MMC and that in Michigan we've had this general decline uh, in funding, but it's been different across districts because of the move mm -hmm. towards equalization. So you have variation among districts as well as the statewide trend. And to me at least, it will be very interesting, even though it's probably going to be called a control variable, mm -hmm. what the parameter estimate on that is in six years from now, maybe a lot more significant policy than the stuff around MMC. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So this is, I mean, one, one thing that, I mean, I think Glenn is right, he's kind of pointing out the importance of kind of economic conditions and funding levels, irrespective of what the particular high school graduation requirements are at the time, uh, which I think is a good, a good point. Um, one, I think, once the the point that Sue wanted me to uh, remind people about is that um, in kind of the analysis, this interrupted time series, uh, we it kind of understands and kind of takes into account any kind of smooth, like uh, I guess smooth or uh, constant change over time. So you looked at the trends and kind of when we we're looking at kind of the change relative to the prior trend. So that, because we know that, you know, Michigan today is different than Michigan was five or seven or ten years ago. Um, uh, I mean, some in some positive ways and some less than positive ways in terms of the economic climate. Um, and uh, none of those, I mean, kind of the general trending of the economy, economy one way or another, shouldn't kind of substantially influence kind of the estimates we get using this, uh, kind of the research design we're using now. So, uh, Hi, Dana Dyson, um, University of Michigan, Flint. I have a um, question, perhaps, that, I don't know, maybe it's more of a statement, I don't know, but it seems that we just are going to have students in the state that are going to continue to decline, decline in terms of their academic achievement based on this particular reform. Um, when you have in the bottom quartile students who are either, if the um, MMC is either not having an effect or it's having a negative effect, those predictions for the future seem very negative. That said, we know that there are unintended consequences for policy all the time. And could you please speak on the fact that this suggests that in a few years we're going to have 
21 year old students who are going to be in the same facility with 14 year olds. I mean, I think one, one thing that, uh, one of the, I think, big takeaways for us among the research team was, as I mentioned before, kind of this, the variation in the kind of the, the way in which the policy, policy seems to have differentially affected different uh, subgroups of students. And I think clearly the most, from my perspective, the most troubling aspect of the policy is the, um, is the effects on the bottom quartile of students. Uh, I think, uh, I, th I think that's actually the benefit of some of this early analysis, early research that we can hopefully between some of what we're doing here, some of the kind of more in-depth qualitative work that others are doing and continuing analyses, we can try to really pinpoint kind of the, uh, what Sue said, the kind of the choke points in the pipeline or the problems with this, uh, uh, this particular policy itself and try to, um, uh, help schools and districts adjust and um, I guess uh, help their students even more. I, th I think this is the one last thing I want to kind of uh, show to kind of set up, uh, you know, to highlight the importance of this kind of transcript study that we're embarked on is, you know, one of the things that we'd like to do in addition to looking at the kind of high school completion and achievement outcomes is looking um, at course taking. And obviously the best way to do this is to look at uh, high school transcripts. Um, what we have here is, you know, while we are still working on the high school transcript uh, component of the study, we were able to look at the uh, ACT data. So as you know, students that take the ACT, which is now all test taking students in Michigan high schools, are required to fill out a questionnaire where they answer lots of questions. Um, one set of questions they, have, they answer are about what courses they have taken or plan to take by the time they graduate. Um, and you know, they're, you know, this data should be taken with a large grain of salt because A, it is student self-reports, and uh, you know, uh, B, Courses that may contain certain content might not be labeled the same thing across schools, but kind of even uh, kind of even with a large grain of salt, we thought it was sufficiently interesting to put these in the presentation. The yellow highlighted um, uh, rows are kind of the fraction of students, the percent of students who report. Um, taking the courses that would have met, taking or will have, or would have taken, they report that they have taken or will eventually take the courses required for meeting the Michigan Merit Curriculum. And so we see in the top row um, for these classes of 08, 09, 2010, about 30% of students were reporting taking Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry, and one other math course. This increased uh, to 38% in 2011. So we do see some change even among these very, you know, uh, rough and approximate self, student self-reports. Um, you know, and we see the same thing below for science. Kind of the fraction of students taking biology plus chemistry or physics goes from 60, 70% um, to 80%. But so I think we do see some change, which kind of, I think, tells me that there's some information in these figures. But one thing that we see is, you know, the number 38% in 2011 for the fraction taking classes that would meet the MMC. 38% is very different than 100%. Um, and even if we take into account the, you know, personal curriculum, and even if we take into account uh, the large grain of salt of student self-reports, I think this, this is suggestive that there's kind of been differential uh, implementation across schools and districts in the state. Um, and uh, I mean, I think this, this kind of illustrates the importance of the second component of the project we're doing, which is the transcript study, where we can actually get in and talk to teachers and principals, um, look at transcripts, and really try to understand what was going on um, in the schools. So, uh, so this is the final slide, conclusions. Um, uh, importance of examining impact separately by student preparation level. Um, 
potential slippage in implementation. Uh, will this, uh, will schools grow in their ability to implement over time? Uh, hopefully the, the transcript and related uh, data work will shed some light on that. There's some variation across subjects, which I think is kind of interesting and puzzling. Um, the math versus science, I think, is particularly kind of interesting and puzzling to me. Um, and then the broader implications for other states. Um, as you saw before, Michigan is just one of many states. Um, I mean, more than half the states so far have passed policies very, very similar to the Michigan Merit Curriculum. So, you know, many, many states in the coming years will be uh, implementing similar reforms. And then the Common Core is going to present a roughly similar challenge, um, uh, probably many other challenges as well, but kind of a similar challenge at the high school level in terms of more advanced course taking requirements. So, um, with that, thank you very much.